Well, very warm welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Harris. If we haven't met before, I help to lead the work of Christians in Parliament All Party group here in Parliament. And the group exists to support all members and staff in their work here in the House. And uh, this is through a variety of different uh, means, chapel services, uh, weekly groups, one-to-one -one support, written briefings, and evenings like this one. And this evening is part of a regular series of events that we hold that, where we seek to examine the personal and the public relevance of the Christian faith to our lives today. And we're really delighted to welcome Jonathan Aitken here this evening, who has uh, kindly agreed to share something of his personal story with us. And we're very grateful to Fiona Bruce, MP, who is going to interview Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan needs uh, a little by way of introduction, but, and Fiona is going to get into the detail in a moment. But just, just in brief, uh, he was a, he's a former member of parliament and cabinet minister. Uh, he's been a journalist and a broadcaster. He's the author of 17 books. He's the president or trustee of several criminal justice ch charities. And he speaks all over the world about prison reform and about the Christian faith. Jonathan, we're so grateful to have you here this evening. Thank you very much, Mark. And good evening, everyone. And good evening, Jonathan. It's a huge privilege to have you here. You've had a remarkable career. And I think the numbers of people here, including very many parliamentarians from both houses, are testament to the interest that there is in hearing uh, of your stories and of your uh, varied career through, uh, through many years. Uh, as uh, Mark has said initially, you worked um, as a Fleet Street journalist uh, in the 1960s and you served as a war correspondent in Vietnam, Biafra and the Middle East. In 1974, you were elected as the MP for Thanet East, uh, which then became South Thanet. And you spent 18 years on the backbenches, so there's hope for it all, um, <laughs> before, before being appointed as the Minister of Defence Procurement under John Major in 1992. And you were then promoted to the Cabinet as Chief Secretary to the Treasury in 1994. Uh, and I know reading uh, the first of many books that you've written, that, that was very much a high point uh, in your life. But then you went on to find that you were fighting a libel case with The, with the Guardian, which went on for some years, um, and in particular uh, culminated in events in 1997, um, which I thought it might be interesting for you just to tell uh, people here something of what happened at that point and, and again how you responded to it in your life. Well, it's sometimes good in a story to start at a low point. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the libel case in the Guardian was certainly that. Um, it was a catastrophic own goal, personally and in every other way. And, and if anyone's interested, there's no point going into the detail of it. Uh, but um, it was rather a kind of febrile time, not like now in English politics, when um, there was the government was a fragile state, uh, and uh, newspapers then as now um, were quite aggressive sometimes. Mm -hmm. And uh, an article appeared which I, I'm afraid through a combination of sort of hubris and arrogance, got very hot under the collar about. It and sued for libel rather spectacularly. Usually, lawyers know to just send a piece of paper around to um, uh, and people who are suing. But I um, was so sort of arrogant enough to give a press conference saying I'm going to um, uh, sue The Guardian and I produced some reasons why that was happening. And then a phrase which haunts me because I have to watch on, on television so often of a quiz show comes up <laughs> as a joke item. And I stand there saying something like, and I'm going to fight the Guardian with a, a trusty sword of truth and a field, shield of fair play. And of course, there was a fundamental flaw in my um, shield and sword and whole libel case, which was that I was telling on one aspect of it, or many aspects of it, but one aspect that I was telling a lie uh, on oath about a hotel there in the Ritz Hotel. Very ancient stuff, but anyway, it was enough 
at the last minute, great surprise, because the case seemed, mm -hmm. I think everyone said, to be going my way, but suddenly new evidence was produced which proved that I had told a lie about who paid my 800 pound hotel bill in the Ritz Hotel in Paris, and it was all over and crash. Uh, my life as I had known it was over. So that mm -hmm. was a very abbreviated summary of the disaster of the rival case. And it's just worth saying that was the beginning of the disaster. It sounds you know, pretty bad losing rival case. But I sometimes say that I entered then a kind of vortex, sort of downward spiral, which I went through in my sort of mnemonic origins um, defeat, disgrace, divorce, bankruptcy, and jail. Now, that is a pretty good royal fashion crisis, by the way. And that's, I think, the point where you want to pick up. It certainly is. <coughs> so, thank you for that. And, um, and for, for being so um, open with, with us, as you, you have been, I know, um, throughout the period since then, because you, you lost the libel case in 1997. And, in fact, <coughs> a month uh, later, you also um, lost your seat in the 1997 general election. So, uh, it really was a difficult time. And then, two years later, you pleaded guilty to perjury um, and perverting the course of justice at the Old Bailey. Um, I think many of my colleagues now will be very interested to know what happened within that two-year period in the sense that you were um, still um, uh, very much in um, touch with many parliamentary colleagues and um, interested to know um, how they related to you and which perhaps or how they were helpful to you during this period and what you learnt um, about them during this time. Well, the period we're talking about um, from the moment the libel case collapsed to the moment of standing in the dock of the old lady um, to be sentenced to prison was a two-year period. Mm. Now that's a long time, but the mills of justice grind extremely slowly in this country sometimes. And on the one hand, it was a time of tremendous sort of misery. I began with sort of it feeling angry, but very quickly I realized that it was really all my own fault. And um, living through this period when everything was going wrong. Uh, those who think that prayers get answered um, <coughs> immediately. Uh, I certainly learned that no prayer, I said. <laughs> if you've got answered, you can imagine. Please don't let me be found out. Please don't any more articles. Please don't be left trusted. Not a single one answered. <coughs> so, um, but uh, there were silver linings to these very, very dark clouds. And one of them was that um, mysteriously friends came alongside me. I think in all disasters there are periods when you do find out um, who your friends are. And politics, I'm afraid, is full of fellow friends who, when they think you're on the rise, um, are <coughs> very generous as they want. But when things go wrong, vanish <coughs> But there are a handful of people who I sometimes call my hoops of steel club after that line in Shakespeare. And there were people from this house who came alongside me. Um, and I think the only surviving parliamentarian in this little group was Alistair Burt. But there were people like, for example, Michael Allison, who had uh, the Yorkshire MP, and he'd had been a minister, and he'd been parliamentary private secretary for Margaret Thatcher. And I'm bound to say, I always thought he was just sort of dullest person in the House of Commons. <laughs> <laughs> How wrong I was, um, because when he saw a sort of brother parliamentarian in desperate, dire straits, he very much came alongside with his friendship, with his wisdom, with his counsel. And this little group, there were one or two other ex-founders, Tom Bennion had been an MP, and they sort of formed a prayer group. And I wasn't entirely enthusiastic about this at the beginning. Um, I used to belong at this time, if I belonged to anything at all, uh, to the church registered wing of Anglicanism. And uh, we didn't do praying out loud, so these <laughs> people started thinking, we've got to come and pray for you. But anyway, gradually I got involved, and they were wonderful sources of um, accountability, of uh, friendship, and they were extraordinarily faithful. We used to meet every... Um, Thursday, I think it was, morning, um, and there's always bad news to report. 
and the nine going bankrupt or uh, something else happening. Uh, but the stuck by this very, very <coughs> difficult two year period um, and they were rocks of um, support mm-hmm. and prayer and um, made a huge difference in my life. I think that will be very interesting and helpful for some of us who have colleagues going through difficult times at the moment. So thank you for sharing that. Could you also share a little bit about how your relationship with God developed over this time? Well, not easily. There are many Christian speakers who say, well, I had a wonderful conversion experience. Hallelujah. It was, uh, uh, I was a Christian, it was wonderful then on. With me, it was a much more difficult journey. Uh, partly because I was sort of fighting old battles with bad sides of my character. Um, like blaming God, <coughs> sorry, blaming other people. Um, but um, I, at the same time, I think I'd have been very insensitive when the whole world was falling apart. If I hadn't sort of tried to say, well, where did I go wrong? Uh, let me try and examine, uh, not who said what to whom, but where were the fault lines. And I sort of started to work things out, but it wasn't an easy, quick path. Mm-hmm. I, I remember it as being a path of a lot of stumbling, falling, backsliding, sinning, wondering if I wasn't going crazy, was this a sort of foxhole conversion to be praying every Thursday morning with friends. So it wasn't easy, but rather than I come on as on a train journey through the night in what used to be old Europe and you're crossing frontiers, you don't actually know necessarily the moment um, when you have moved from one stage to another, but I think you do know when you have arrived in the completely new territory of a real and committed faith. And that didn't happen quickly. I would think it took most of the two year period mm-hmm. we were talking about. <coughs> but by the time I had to go off into prison, I was absolutely confident that I had a real and committed faith. It was quite painful getting there, but um, I felt it was real. Thank you. Just briefly, in, in one of your books, you, you, you described your early relationship with God as rather like that with the bank manager. Would you like to uh, briefly yes, elaborate I, I on that? Yes, what I meant by that, um, probably like quite a few members of Parliament, I'm not pointing at anyone here, but um, if someone had come and asked me, are you a Christian, during most of my parliamentary life, I'd have slightly quivered thinking this is a really cheesy question, but I would have said yes. Uh, and if they'd gone a bit further down being a sort of pushy evangelical and they'd said, um, well, what sort of relationship do you have with the Lord? If they'd asked those kind of questions, I, I think I'd have sort of given an affirmative type answer, but the reality was my relationship with the Lord was rather like, and I think this is the point you're drawing out of me, um, my relationship used to be uh, when I was a boy growing up in a small country town where there was still a real bank manager. And my relationship with God was not unlike my relationship with my bank manager. There were some good things about it. I knew he existed. Um, <coughs> I used to go and visit in his premises every so often. So that it a bit polite. Um, I, I thought he could really be quite useful to me one day. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 that, um, and he could always you know, do the spiritual equivalent of providing an overdraft if there'd been a little overspending on the moral cricket. <laughs> but but um, all this time, it wasn't a good relationship because I thought I was in charge of the account yeah. and that I could do things my way, as the Frank Sinatra song goes. And um, so I was at best a half Christian, which I now know is as good as being half pregnant. But at the time, I, 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 I thought it was sort of OK to um, have this um, you know, I'll take charge of the report and account and do it my way. So it wasn't a satisfactory relationship, and the bank manager joke sort of works. Mm, it does, it does. It's a very good explanation. And then, just before we move on to you um, being sentenced, um, looking at it now from a, a, a more mature Christian perspective, what would you identify as the route to the, the difficulties which you experienced and which led to, obviously, that, uh, yeah. that sentence? Well, the root cause, uh, a good one-word answer, was pride, mm. um, which has many uh, formats. Uh, C.S. Lewis, in his book, Mere Christianity, says pride is the 
great anti great sin. It's the complete anti God state of mind, and that's true. Um, I think now that the Christian journey is one of moving from self-centeredness to God-centeredness. Difficult journey for anybody, but it's particularly difficult for anybody who is puffed up, uh, as parliamentarians sometimes can quite easily get. I mean, I am. Um, uh, was never really a very important minister, but um, you know, just as parliamentary life, go back to what Sir saying, the honourable member thinks this, isn't the honourable member wonderful? Um, or um, then you get to become a minister, and when I was a defence, well, you know, I had my own RAF uh, plane <coughs> taking me under the guards of honour, saluting, and the chief secretary's a powerful job, and uh, uh, the whole yes minister's scene, which is on the whole completely true, um, is all rather exciting, and it goes to the head of it. And so the journey from um, away from self-centeredness uh, towards God-centeredness is a difficult one, and, and I think it is a, a tougher road for parliamentarians yes. and many others. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that. So that pride was <clears throat> well and truly punctured when, in June 1999, you were sentenced to 18 months in prison, and you were taken off to uh, HM Belmarsh. Um, would you like to tell us what it was like arriving there and, and what your first night was, ni was like? Uh, I, had, I did start with one advantage. I had always known that I would have to go to prison. So I was sort of, uh, up to a point, prepared for it. But nothing really can prepare you for prison. It's a tremendous culture shock. Planet prison is a very strange place indeed. Uh, the first thing that happens is you come off the van, the white prison van, and you enter the cage. And the cage in Belmarsh, which is Britain's highest security prison, is about the size of this room. It's an iron-barred enclosure. And the day I arrived on the 8th of June, 1999, business was extremely brisk for some reason. Uh, sentenced prisoners were arriving from courts all over London and the southeast. And with the habitual optimism of criminals, uh, most of them, I think, had thought that uh, the jury would believe every word they said and they'd be found not guilty, or if that went wrong, the judge would be very lenient. But when you arrive in the cage in Belmarsh, uh, having been weighed off, as they say, for a seven or whatever it is, um, boy, does reality dawn in a very painful way. And I remember sort of extraordinary scenes like um, uh, you know, men fighting, sobbing, uh, and uh, you're told that you're going through a process called induction, which is a word which survives only in two places in institutional Britain, Her Majesty's Prisons and the Church of England. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> vicars and criminals get inducted into their institutions. I need to say the rituals are rather different, uh, mugshot, fingerprinting, strip searching. In the middle of this, uh, there was a moment of an uh, extraordinary comedy, which I'll share with you, uh, when uh, an officer came up to me and said, Aiken, your turn to see the psychiatrist. Now, I was feeling a bit down, I needed to say, but um, I hadn't thought I really needed the assistance of a psychiatrist this moment, but yours not to reason why in a prison, and so off I went. And actually, I was seeing the psychiatrist, as every prisoner does, a very sensible reason, you get checked out whether or not you're a suicide risk. Good idea. I just didn't know it at the time. Anyway, to get through the humor of this moment, I uh, need to remind the younger people in this audience yes. that um, um, my sentencing had not gone unnoticed by the great British public and the great British media. Or indeed the global media, I <laughs> think it would be fair to say. Um, and that day outside the Old Bailey, there had been something extraordinary, like 200 journalists and more, had, uh, in the great tradition of good crowds showing up to see the hanging, um, had turned up um, <laughs> outside Belmarsh with our satellite dishes going live on the six o'clock news. But somehow or other, all this excitement had passed the prison psychiatrist by. And he had been having a busy day, reason enough, he hadn't been tuning into the media. So to him, I was just another completely anonymous prisoner who has to be checked out. And he does this by raffling off a set of questions from a bog standard form rather fast. He says, name, date of birth, prison number, next of kin, does your next of kin know you're in prison? And the question after that was, does anyone other than your next of kin know you're in prison? <laughs> <laughs> I, I gave the psychiatrist a wry smile um, and said, well, as a matter of fact, I think maybe 
15 or 20 million people will know I'm interested. <laughs> the psychiatrist did not return my wry smile. He scribbled busily on his pad. And then he said in tones of some asperity, do you really mean to tell me that you think 20 million people? <laughs> <laughs> so I nodded. And then suddenly his tone became gentle and indeed more clinical. And he said in a soft, kind voice, may I ask you, uh, CB9298, have you in your life ever suffered from delusions? <laughs> uh, that was just a... a, a, a but it was a, it, it is a cultural shock. I don't want to make the, too light of it. It was a very, very difficult day, a few days coming into prison. Yeah, thank you for that lovely story. So you, you were in prison, and um, obviously you, you had to work through uh, your relationship with the other prisoners. Um, mm. what, what was that like for you? Well, it was very cautious at first. Um, uh, a Tory cabinet minister is not an immediately popular figure. Uh, in, uh, in a jail, um, but um, I had a bit of luck uh, very early on when a young prisoner came up to me and said in a conspiratorial whisper, I've got a problem, could I do me a favour? And his problem, uh, he said, I've got a letter from my brief, I can't read it, could you read it to me? So I read in this letter and it was um, telling him that he and his uh, partner and that son were going to be evicted from their uh, council flat in Lambeth for non-payment of rent. And he shouted, what should I do, what should I do, and he got this news. And as it happens, in the confines of Belmarsh Prison, he couldn't have come to a more expert source of advice, because like many MPs, I'd been doing eviction cases for the ministry. <laughs> so I knew all the wrinkles about how to get time. I told him this, and he was very pleased. And then he said, I've got another problem. I don't do no reading nor no writing, neither. Could you write it for me? So I wrote it for him, and he signed it. And then, rather unexpectedly, instead of doing what you might have thought he would do, put it in the post box, put it in his pocket, just keep it in his pocket, whatever, he suddenly transformed himself, this young guy, into a um, sort of 18th century town crier. And he held this letter aloft, and he went down the wing saying over and over again, hey guys, this MP geezer of ours, he's got fantastic joined up writing. <laughs> And actually, he, he did me a tremendous favour because his testimonial to my graphological skills fell on the uh, ears of a very receptive audience because it is one of the uncomfortable facts about prison that something like a third of all prisoners can't read or write properly. And so when the word got round, thanks to the town crier, that there was a prisoner willing to read and write letters for um, other prisoners, I became a very useful member of the community, and that was sort of my entry ticket. Um, and um, it was, um, and I, every night I used to have at least six, eight people wanting letters re read to them or written for them, the most intimate subjects imaginable. And this was... <laughs> 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 and, and there, was, so. <laughs> there was a certain amount of sort of prison joshing about this. I remember one old lad coming and saying, oh, John, he says, do you realize all this letter writing business of yours, he was making a fantastic impact on the girls of Brixton. <laughs> uh, they, they, they can't believe the improvement in the quality of the love letters they get. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you for that. So, as, as well as obviously developing a, a, a relationship with um, certain people in and possibly outside prison, what about your relationship with, with God during this time? How did that develop? Well, I was sort of committed in my mind and heart, and that was a good start. Uh, secondly, I discovered, as monks have done down the ages, uh, that cells are very good places to pray in, to read, to think, to reflect. Uh, so this was a, um, uh, a, a sort of strengthening process. And then, of course, prisoners at that time like now, I think there are all kinds of staffing problems. So we were banged up, as they say, and our cells were a very high percentage of the time. And this didn't bother me at all. It bothered a lot of people, but it didn't bother me because I was all the time giving time to um, sorry, letters and reading, thinking, praying, Bible reading. So that, that was a plus. But I don't think I'd have got very far if it hadn't been um, for 
uh, an extraordinary development, um, which um, I'll tell you about. When a young Irish burglar asked me into his cell one evening um, and started a conversation. And he'd been a guy I'd been writing quite a few letters for. And he began this conversation um, talking as we did for the next hour, because time doesn't move in prison. Things prisoners usually talk about their regrets, their families, what they're going to do when they get out. And then suddenly, about after an hour or so, Paddy changed gear. And I immediately recognized, as any of you in this audience would, the gear he changed into, because it was a sort of formal vote of thanks type gear. After all this intimate conversation, he said something. <clears throat> John, on behalf of the lads, I'd, I'd really like to thank you for all these letters you've been writing for me and others. And I've decided to give you a present to show you how much I appreciate it. The present I'm going to give you is that you can have anything you have, care to choose, free of charge, from my library. And then he dived on the left-hand side of his bed, a tattoo or cardboard box, and suddenly produced them. And he spread them out in front of my eyes an amazing selection of hardcore porn magazines. <laughs> and anything, anything you want out of it. And after a fleeting moment of temptation, I said, um, <laughs> I said, thanks, but no thanks, buddy. But I obviously said it in a way that was reverting to my old profession of being a pompous politician because something about the way I said it made him climb up the wall shouting and screaming, oh, judging me, are you sneering, are you looking down on me, are you? And then before I could stem this molten flow of anger, he um, had the most ingenious idea of why I might have said no, thank you. And he said, oh, but if it's boys you're after. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's not those boys. I used to like those first kind of magazines. Why do you say no, thanks? Sir? I really didn't want to answer this question, but I did. Um, rather hesitating. I said, well, if you really want to know, Paddy, so I'm, I'm on a different path in life. Oh, what kind of path would that be then? So, if you really want, it's a path of having a faith. It's a path of uh, believing in Jesus, following his teachings, and it's sort of changing my life. And then Paddy said, you know, I'd really like to get on that path myself. How do I get on this path? So I said, well, well you pray, Paddy. How do you pray? Well, talk about the blind leading the blind. Now, anyway, <laughs> Paddy and I prayed together. First night, second night, third night, fourth night. And then Paddy started to say, ooh, this stuff's too good just to keep to the two of us. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought he was going to find another um, Irish burglar to make our twosome or threesome. But Paddy had lots of energy and drive and Irish charm, and he shot off around the jail recruiting, saying, anyone want to come and pray with me and John out tonight? Uh, and uh, about a dozen most extraordinary characters um, showed up. I always remember some of them the rest of my life. One of them was a black O's and armed robber, another was a, a blower who cracked safes for a living. Um, there was a kiter who was an exotic fraudster, bouncing so many checks they fly around like kites. There was a couple more Irish burglars, a couple of lifers who were murderers. And suddenly we seemed to have an um, astonishing uh, little group gave a new meaning to the Christian term, a cell group. There we were. <laughs> <laughs> and this group met night after night after night. Of course, some people uh, dropped out when they found that praying didn't get you parole next Tuesday automatically. But on the whole, and this strange group, I was not its leader, I was quick to say. I was its greatest follower and learner. But it sort of did something with this group. Um, and the strange fellowship in the fraternity of the fallen of praying. And, um, and if I was to pick out one thing which sort of made a great impact, um, which was understanding when people address God, because we always used to pray out loud. And, uh, and of course, some people begin our Father, Father God. In prison, that has a tremendous poignant ring, mm -hmm. because I knew by this stage most of these guys had no idea who their fathers were. Yeah. Or if they had, they'd never seen him. So this longing for a rock of paternal trust came across. And of course, we were all having conversation. And then some people prayed, oh, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ, because they longed for the things that Jesus stands for, love, compassion, mercy, healing, forgiveness of sinners. And then there were people who learned to pray for the Holy Spirit. Um, and they were people who had problems like drug addiction, very serious in prison. They knew they couldn't say no to the pushers by their own power, but they'd got the message that the 
guide, advocate, comforter, Holy Spirit was there to empower them, so they prayed to the Holy Spirit to have his power. And I found this extraordinary stuff, especially when it started to bring about results. And people threw away their porn magazine, um, started to be friendly to the um, pariah prisoners like the sex offenders. Um, and the people who had drug problems started to win their battles. Um, so, um, and after I came out of prison, I made another interesting career move. And I went to the one place in the whole country which uh, had worse food and worse plumbing than the prison. And this was an Anglican theological college called Wycliffe Hall in Oxford. <laughs> but I immediately had to write, uh, write essays. One of the first one explained the doctrine of the Trinity. Never understood it academically, really. <laughs> but I understood it perfectly in that uh, prison group yeah. because you heard, you know, these God the Father, what does it mean? Yes. Uh, coming together, uh, the three persons of God. Yeah. So that was the kind of thing that really got to me deeply. Well, that, that's, that's a lovely story. And just before we move on to, to what you've done um, since prison, um, very interested to know how your understanding of, of, of grace um, changed during that time. You, you've written uh, on Amazing Grace and, and uh, about John Newton, who wrote that famous hymn. Well, grace is sort of word with a stoop in it. God reaches down mercifully and generously to offer his forgiveness, his kindness, to people who probably don't deserve it, haven't earned it. And it's a, one of the great godly mysteries um, of why God could reach a wretch like me, as sort of Newton put it in his hymn, uh, and offer that uh, restoring gift of grace. And we could go on for hours about this, but I think um, uh, one of the reasons I've enjoyed so much going back into prison, as I do all the time, talking about grace and forgiveness, is that for those who've experienced it, as of course I have, um, the joy of communicating it to others. I was uh, uh, giving the talk, you know, the sermon, uh, the Sunday before last in Brixton Prison, and it was a quite a tense occasion for various reasons, uh, because it was the first time ever they'd had both the vulnerable prisoners, the sex offenders, and the ordinary prisoners in the same room, um, and that was quite something. And there is no Christian chaplain in Brixton at the moment. Uh, there are three Muslim chaplains, all very well remunerated, who are good guys, and they do a great job, but there are weaknesses at the moment in prison ministry, which I... Um, struggling to help with. Yes, that's, that's interesting. Just before you tell us more about that, which we, wa we want to hear about, um, what do you say to those who would say that your faith was, was a psychological <coughs> crutch, as one could call it, um, after all the difficulties that you'd been through? Well, I used to worry about that enormously myself. Um, am I just uh, having a foxhole conversion for uh, convenience? And if I wasn't thinking that way myself, uh, there were no shortage of uh, cynics uh, pouring bucketfuls of their cynicism all over me. Um, when I went off to Wycliffe or when I was uh, giving talks in churches or anything like that. And at first I rather minded about that, but then I very quickly recovered and said, don't be so absurd. Um, uh, because um, anything I do, I think anything any uh, Christian voice tries to do. Who are you doing it for? What's it all about? You're doing it for an audience of one. You're not trying to win votes or score public relations points or get reported in the media, which doesn't happen anyway. Uh, you're doing it for the audience of one. So I, I don't worry at all about the cynics. And actually, I'm rather on their side, if anything. I think if I, a different uh, era had heard about some parliamentary colleague who'd gone to prison, come out saying, oh, I found God and everything's better now. I don't think that's might have said, how very convenient. It's quite a natural reaction. So um, I, it doesn't worry me. I think anything with the passage of time, it's now nearly 20 years since I was in mm. prison. So uh, I think um, uh, the cries of cynicism are abating a bit, but they won't always. Tell us something about your prison work now. Well, I do quite a lot of things. I mean, I still earn my living uh, as a writer and as a, um, uh, have a 
business with my son. Uh, but my heart is really in charitable work, and particularly in prison charitable work, for which there is a limitless demand and not very many uh, people doing it. And um, there are well-known prison charities like Prison Fellowship, founded by my good friend and mentor, Charles Colson in the United States. And there are charities like um, <coughs> Caring for Ex-Offenders. But on the whole, I tend to think that um, the state can't do at the kind of work which good Christian charities can mm. do in the rehabilitation field. Mm. So I'm always on the lookout for small charities which are local usually. Now, for example, I'm enormously proud to be involved in uh, a, a charity called Tempus Novo, which started two years ago when two rather hairy heel prison officers from uh, Leeds, but fr straight from the Geoffrey Boycott School of Bluntness, um, showed up and said <laughs> they'd read something I'd written along the lines of, you know, prison officers really understand rehabilitation pretty well, the good ones. I have a lot of time for good prison officers. Why don't we encourage them? And these guys said, we all our lives we long for somebody to say that. Um, we'd love to, we don't, we're tired of being turnkeys and jailers. And so they started this charity, which they gave the rather learned name of Tempus Novo to. Last year, it's really a <coughs> first full year, these two guys, both senior officers, um, they put 130 young men from Leeds and Bradford and Wilson Prison into jobs in the Leeds Bradford area. That when they're, and their line is, you know, we know these guys, we know who's likely to be a no hoper, we know who's got a chance of going to. They also go off and do their weekend drinking with what might be called low cost employers. I mean, undertakers, tirey services, <coughs> dustbin men, but they're very good at, uh, and, and so they, that's, and that gives me a huge thrill that 130 young men have, have been, and 80% of them, or more, 85% of them have been, stayed in those jobs for now over nine months. So I love that kind of work and I do that. Then I have a bit of Christian work in prisons. Um, prison ministry isn't in good shape at the moment for various reasons. Uh, and. Um, so there's lots to be done, and, and I love doing it. That's yes. where my heart is. Yeah, wonderful. And, and um, just before we, we go into some questions, just t t two more I'd like to ask. Um, if you could tell us what you've found most challenging about being a Christian over the years, but also um, what's been the most rewarding thing for you? Well, I think the being a Christian seems to be being a non-stop challenge. Um, and gets almost more challenging, but at the heart of it, I think, is uh, those two great commandments of loving God and loving your neighbour. And uh, I personally uh, have learned how to um, uh, listen and communicate with God in prayer, and that's the heart of it. Um, and, you know, there are disappointments and failures uh, as well as successes, but the great success, I think, is just sort of joy. Um, uh, and this faith is a faith of joy. It's not a faith of quick, easy answers. Uh, mine certainly didn't come quickly or easily. But the journey from self-centeredness to God-centeredness, if you persist in it and stick with it, um, I think uh, I am a very, very happy person uh, these days, and I hope that can come across. I should perhaps say, one of the reasons I'm very happy is uh, since coming out of prison, I've remarried. My wife is here tonight, sitting in the front row. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> she, she absolutely deserves applause. <laughs> 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 but just a, a couple of things to be said about Elizabeth, which is interesting, just in this one, uh, in the Attlee room. Her father was a member of Attlee's cabinet. And she remembers going to Christmas parties, checkers with Athlete playing Father Christmas. She remembers sitting on Ernie Bevin's knee. So that's a sort of historical thing. And um, she was then married to not one but two movie stars. She was Mrs. Rex Harrison and Mrs. Richard Harris, which gives me a rather hard act to follow as a husband. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but she's my greatest friend, prayer partner. That's and uh, despite her recent health problems, 
uh, we have a great life together. Uh, that's a wonderful, wonderful um, note to end on, but I do want to ask one further question, if I may, yeah. before I ask um, uh, uh, for any questions from the audience. And, and, and it is this, really it's for the benefit of the parliamentarians who are here, of which there are many. If you were starting your political life again here, how would you go about it differently with the faith that you now have? Well, first of all, I believe that the parliamentary life of service is a great calling and a great opportunity to do wonderful things as a, a, an MP or minister or member of the House of Lords. So stick with that. And then say, well, um, you know, we're all full of frailties and sinners, but one of the ways to avoid uh, having a disaster like mine, or even doing the whole thing unsatisfactorily, is to think that you are the centre of the universe. You can walk on water, it's all to... And instead, if you can find as your foundation and your navigating points a, a Christian faith, I think that is a huge strength to uh, to you, uh, and that in the end, it may get sniffed out a bit by the cynics, but I think, um, as I've said, Mr. Gladstone, it's the character breathing through the sentences that counts, and I think people who do have uh, some roots and faith and live the life just don't talk the talk, but actually walk the walk, that comes through and shines through and has a huge influence on the wider world. But above all, you yourself will know, which I didn't know, um, because I wasn't doing it, uh, that you have a real purpose and a God sense of drive in your life. Thank you so much. That is a wonderful, wonderful note to end on. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please thank John Thank you.